Hello everyone, I'm Divika Kier, a second year general cardiology fellow at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. I wanted to share an interesting case from our cath lab where we performed a complex distal left main and proximal circumflex PCI. There were some complications during the procedure which have some great imaging and management learning points. We have no relevant relationships with commercial interests to disclose. Our patient is an 81 year old Southeast Asian woman who presented with worsening exertional dyspnea in YHA class three to four and crescendo angina that was going on for a month prior to presentation. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension, known coronary artery disease. She had PCI to the RCA six years prior to this admission and stage two non-small cell lung cancer. She did receive radiation and is currently in remission. Her diagnostic workup showed positive uptrending troponins. She also had this new reduction in her EF to 30 to 35% with new wall motion abnormalities. Her invasive coronary assessment showed a heavily calcified lesion in the distal left main, 95%, extending into the proximal circumflex artery, as we can see in this video on the right. She also had a CTU of the LED right after the takeoff of her first diagonal branch with collaterals from right to left, with otherwise uh, mild to moderate non-obstructive disease in the RCA. Given her age, frailty, and comorbidities, she was not deemed to be a good surgical candidate. She was subsequently planned for a high-risk atherectomy and PCI of the left main and circumflex arteries. The LED given flow from the RCA collaterals was not planned to be intervened on during this procedure. As we can see in this picture on the right, so she has an impella CP with the left femoral axis uh, for support. There were good flows, 3.6 to 3.7 liters when we started the case. Our guiding catheter that we used here is XB3 for support. We used Fielder XD wire um, to cross the lesion in the circumflex, which was followed by a Caravel catheter with a plan to exchange it for a support wire, which was Grand Slam in our case. However, when we were pulling out the Caravel, there was some resistance pulling back and the tip fractured as we can see in this image on the right. At this point, we used a second wire and advanced it parallel to the first wire and using a guideline of our support, we were able to retrieve the first Grand Slam wire and the fractured catheter tip. The fractured catheter tip on the Grand Slam is seen on this image on the right. Then we proceeded with laser atherectomy we used 0.9 millimeter laser in the proximal and mid segment of the circumflex artery. After balloon pre dilatation, a 3.5 into 16 millimeter drug eluting stent was deployed in the proximal circumflex artery extending into the left main. As we can see in the video on the bottom, the stent seemed to be well expanded on angiography. Given it was left main and proximal circumflex PCI, we used intravascular ultrasound to make sure there, the stent is well-sized and well-opposed. The stent seems to be well-opposed. However, proximal to the stent, we see this flap of dissection extending into the left main and into the aorta. Then we proceed with deploying a four millimeter into 12 millimeter drug eluting stent in the left main. And the stent was expanded with a plan to close the dissection flap completely. Final angiography demonstrates excellent results in the left main and proximal circumflex artery. There is residual diffuse disease in the two obtuse marginal arteries, but we don't feel it's amenable to intervention given the small size of the vessels and there is good flow at this point. After the procedure, our patient was monitored in the hospital for 48 hours. She did need two units of blood transfusion, which was likely due to blood loss during the procedure and maybe some hemolysis with the impella used during the PCI. 
there was no evidence of retroperitoneal bleed. She did not have any significant pericardial effusion on her follow-up echocardiogram, and she did not have any hematoma on her access sites. She reported significant improvement in her symptoms and was discharged home with home care services on dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagrelor for an year. So I wanted to ask the audience a question at this point. What is the best approach for retained PCI equipment in the coronary circulation? And our options are A, conservative management, B, entrapment with a stent, C, retrieval guided by a balloon, D, micro snare, E, helical snare using two guide wires, or F, all of the above? And the correct, the correct answer is F, all of the above. Uh, depending on where the fragment is and the size of the fragment, there are multiple options to deal with the retained wire or catheter fragment. If it is very small, it can just be left in place and allowed to endothelialize. If it is very long, and depending on whether it extends into the guiding catheter or not, if it extends into the catheter, then we can use a balloon uh, and inflate it to entrap the, the fragment against the side of the guide and then retrieve it. If it does not extend into the guide, then removal with a micro snare is the best choice. However, if a micro snare is not readily available, then using two new guide wires through a torquing device, it can create an effective helical snare to entrap the retained wire, which is the approach that we use in the case presented here. And finally, I just wanted to end with some conclusions and learning points. Retention of PCI equipment is usually a rare event. However, when it happens, as we just discussed before, multiple options are available and the management usually depends on the size of the fragment, the location of entrapment within the vessel, whether it's proximal or distal, and local expertise and the equipment at hand. Coronary dissection is much more frequent during PCI than coronary angiography alone. And some of the risk factors, the guide catheter can cause dissection with extension to the aortic root. However, more commonly what happens is usually by advancement of the guide wire and balloon inflation, usually in very calcified high-risk vessels. The last learning point I want to stress upon is that uh, intravascular ultrasound should always be utilized to evaluate stent sizing and expansion, especially for left main, proximal LED, and proximal circumflex PCI. As in this case, if we did not use IVIS, we would have missed the intimal dissection, which can have catastrophic consequences. And finally, stenting the dissected area remains the standard of treatment for coronary dissection. I would like to thank you all for your time and attention.